So yeah, as I said, my name is Christian Nikkonen. Uh, most of you probably know me as Gisoli for the non Finns, that basically means a cat. Just some context, but not here to talk about myself, but instead the thing I worked the last year on. So what I did was revamp a web service with a reacting like single page application. And yes, I'm in a bit of a hurry here, so I have a lot of slides. So excuse me if I tangle in my words. So but this is the Finnish product. So yeah, the screen here. Uh, so basically, it's a Finnish technology magazine, and my mic is a bit better. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's a tech magazine. It has a lot of technology articles. Uh, it has a weekly digital magazine. This is a new thing. Before this uh, new site, it only was it was only published twice a month, but. When we did this, we upped it to once a week. But enough of this, you can check it out if you want to. I don't know if anyone heard that, but you might ask, why would you build this one if you've seen the previous one? But yeah. So first of all, this started as an MVP to see if headless WordPress would suit the client's purposes. Um, and yeah, the new digital magazine was one thing. The old site was a, it's so legacy that it was hard to implement such a thing in it anymore. And it also serves as a building foundations for the whole media group. Uh, the media group has like 20 different magazines similar to this. So we can use this as a general building block. And the client wanted to adapt modern software development practices. And last but not least, the old site was pretty awful. Uh, just one thing to note about it, uh, subscriber page, payload, so page. page loads took sometimes over 30 seconds. And yeah, if you ever use a page that takes 30 seconds to load, that's not good. But how would you build this? The most obvious ones, add filter. An action should be rather self-explanatory. So every time we wanted to change something, we did this. And we hook these few thousand lines of our code with them, obviously. So uh, to talk about a few thousand lines of code, I basically built a neural resolver. Those who saw me in Uvascular might have remembered that. And we did some custom endpoints as well. And then we used Composure Patches and Patch Package because we had to use some software considered abandonware and we had to fix some bugs in them. So those you don't know, those are nice. Or JavaScript and PHP. And then uh, continuous integration was a key part of all this. It allowed us to ship changes fast uh, run tests on the code, and if the tests didn't fail, we could deploy to production. And this has made breaking production very hard. But still, we managed to do it just yesterday. Uh, some of our stack listed right here. This is not even half, but yeah. So now we get to the interesting part. As I said, I have a lot of content, so I had to do this. Only Finns get this, but that's not my problem. <laughs> so I had to cut a lot of content out, and I prioritized the most interesting ones, so you can go and leave and see Elisa at the end of my talk if you want. But I appreciate if you stay here until the end. But I'm going to start with search engines and social medias. And as you may know, the uh, loading problem is the most common one in single page applications when they're shared to Facebook for the first time. Uh, the clients paste the code, the URL to Facebook and sees nothing but loading in the embed. So how do we avoid that? So 
as you see here in the background, very dim, but it is there. That's the whole HTML response of the single page application that we have. It's less than 80 lines and doesn't contain any meta tags at all, which is unacceptable. So we used Puppeteer to fix this. So Puppeteer is a Node.js library for Google Chrome. It allows us to simulate user interaction and run code. In addition to that, we can just render the whole application in a browser that behaves like the normal Google Chrome. So the basic idea is to run a node server that runs Puppeteer and route to that server from Nginx. It can be done for all users, users that aren't just logged in or just for bots. And we did the bots because it's the easiest one to implement. Uh, the other options kind of require you to code the same way that you would uh, render React traditionally on the server, which is a bit different. So to show you, this is just basic Nginx configuration. We have a pre-render block of the configuration. I don't know if that's the correct term. I'm not an Nginx expert, but I did the config. So uh, we check the user agent with regular expression for these, and if it matches, we simply route them to the pre-render service, which is basically the Puppeteer server. At this point, the Puppeteer server takes control. And just a tiny bit of heads up, uh, we did things a bit differently for Puppeteer. So we add a headless to parameter to the URL when we render the, first, the application first time with Puppeteer. So some tweaks around the application happen, like it's a new site, there's a lot of ads, and ads make the page slower. So we remove the ads, to give you an example. Don't use that to access the site without ads, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so obviously there's this one problem with it. Uh, the same one that F Facebook and Google and others have, that they don't know when the page is ready to be rendered, like, or taken, or snapshotting, or whatever. But it's pretty easy to do once you're in control of the application. So we simply defined this function that checks the global in window called ready to render, that when it equals the true, it completes a promise. So this is basically a promise. If you don't know what the promise is, sorry. <laughs> I'm not gonna explain, I don't have the time. Well, we basically wait until the app says ready, and when it does, we extract HTTP status code from a meta tag that we have. We did that with React. It's a bit hacky, but it works. And if the request ends in a 404, we can have a 404 response instead of the 200 that would otherwise always come out of the property server. And we just take the HTML and return it as is to the bot that's requesting the content. And as a side note, it's a good idea to remove images from the loading process because it doesn't make any sense to load images when the browser doesn't have a screen and no one even looks at the images. The markup doesn't change one bit with this, but it makes it much faster. So uh, what's the ready to render in window? So basically we have a Redux action that we call when uh, the main component on the page has finished loading. And that action starts this saga. Uh, when the application is in headless mode, it does something, like removes the scripts and sets the ready to render the true. If it's not in headless mode, it does nothing. Okay, we'll skip that. So now we have the full content and meta tags. Like, here's the full response. It doesn't fit anymore. And there's meta tags that you can't see, but they're there. Believe me. And, but yeah, there's this one minor problem that nothing actually works. And by doesn't work, I mean everything is broken. Like this should be there and it's there. But so I'm going to let that sink in for a moment. Just read it. So 
Basically, I had to import do not use or you will be haunted by spooky ghosts from styled components. This is because uh, styled components does support server rendering, but it only s exposes the API for it on actual server side. And our server rendering is done in a browser and then just return to our server. So we can't use that, so we had to abuse this little API. And yeah, then we just added it to the is headless check in set rendered. And this four lines of code in total fix all of our CSS. I don't recommend you use styled components, but if you do, you can fix it like this. So just to show you, here's the pre-rendered site. Let's see what kind of demo effect I get today. So, nice, it works. So as you can see, there's content missing, but this is all that the bots care about, the main content. So we skipped everything else to get fast page loads. And my focus was just stolen. So how did we build the new side without breaking the old? As I said, we were building an MVP on top of the old theme-based site, and the old theme-based site had to work as is while we were building the new application that eventually replaced the old site. This was surprisingly easy. I didn't expect it to be this easy. Like, I feel almost stupid including this one. So this is a key part of our code. So every custom shortcode that we had that rendered HTML to the theme-based site, that was basically useless in the React application. So we changed the shortcodes and rendered, uh, returned JSON instead of HTML and uh, injected a component on top of the JSON in, sort of in React. It's a bit hacky, but it works. But it's going to be hacky if you're going to do single-page applications with WordPress. So I wasn't supposed to go there yet. So, uh, so why not optimization and to, a way to make sure that we don't sh actually change anything inside the theme page application? We only loaded code that changes everything we need inside REST API requests, which is pretty easy with this. Just include it in REST API in its action. And no, not there yet either. <laughs> So that one bit of code here, it's missed by the highlighting, but basically every ACF image that we had was in ID format return. So it, when we requested uh, every, anything from the API and it contained an ACF field of an image, it only had an ID, which was basically useless to us. I, we didn't want to make an additional request. So we changed every image inside ACF to an array regardless of uh, what the return type in the graphical user interface was. Then when we wanted to use the same menu for the, both of the applications, uh, we needed to change something, which is to use this filter inside login and changing the query parameters inside REST API is also pretty easy. So this is print mag, but yes, it's actually the digi mag. So we wanted to order it by the publish date instead of the chronological order in WordPress. And we wanted to remove some values from it too. So <laughs> this is just an overview of how you actually change the item. I'm not going to go into detail on that either. How we change the query. So basically, I'm going to show you the function in a bit. But we wanted to include six weeks of next issues of the Digimag in the results instead of from the first published one. So we did it like that. And the removal is also just replace something in the array. There's also some program syntax highlights. So, but yeah, it's basically just a meta query and we have a lot of caching in front of it. So it's fine that it's a meta query. Don't judge me. 
So, moving on to the problem that made me want to quit my career as a developer and move on to live as a sheep farmer. <laughs> so, this is pretty bad if low-end devices take 30 seconds to render your application. So, a few months ago, we started noticing that sometimes when you click the link in the application, uh, it caused a full page reload instead of seamlessly transitioning. Uh, we digged in a bit further and found out that it was actually transitioning, but it was triggering a reload immediately before the transition. So we tried debugging it, but we couldn't even reproduce it. I mean, like every time, it was just a bit different. So the problem got worse and worse. It, we didn't even look at it for months. <laughs> like, it, it didn't occur to some users at all, like me. I didn't have the problem. So finally, our tech lead isolated the problem to Google Tag Manager by simply disabling every single script on the page and just checking what causes it. And it was Google Tag Manager. And after that, it was pretty easy to fix the problem. So in this Stack Overflow answer that you don't have to read, the main catch is that if you have triggers that have set the wait for tags and check validation checkboxes, you have to uncheck them as these are unnecessary and even harmful in single page applications. As the, what these basically do is they abort the uh, page transition inside in traditional web pages, like it aborts the request to the new page and sends the data to Google, and then uh, restarts the request again. So what did this for us? That it tried to abort the request, it didn't, but uh, so the page went where it went, and then it reloaded the page. And if you have a Galaxy trend, you're trying to browse an article, you're going to have to wait 30 seconds for each of them. So that was not very nice. We also had a similar thing with Frosmo as well, and Turns out that trackers don't work really well in case of single page applications. Frosma has fixed it now, but if you have to use trackers, consider again. So, moving on to cache invalidation, the hard part of this presentation. And I'm going to preface this with that this was a major fail. <laughs> so, Start with the easy ones first. Uh, for any front-end assets that you have, CSS, JavaScript, SVGs, use the file name with an MD5 hash in it, like doc.md5hash.jpg. The next one, I don't know, turns out these easy things aren't so popular. And they don't exist. So moving on to the harder parts. So, we use a lot of WordPress transients. So, I built a better class based API. I'm going to go over the strike trees in a moment. But so, basically, yeah, it's a class based API instead of the procedural standard API. It uses it in the background. But yeah, the main feature in it is the predictable transient names. It had prefetch uh, and a list of transients with meta and an inception mode. Which, could, which, lets you put, which lets you put transients within transients. But these were removed for technical reasons. I'm going to tell about them in a moment. But uh, then one thing that uses transients a lot too is uh, the cache proxy endpoint that, we, that I did. It's for third party or native WordPress endpoints. So say post endpoint, we can't easily transientify that. But if we route it to the cache proxy, yeah, no problem. Uh, on top of that, I added automatical transients for all custom API endpoints. It's just one line of code if you want to use transients in it or not. And magic needs some ugly things behind it. So, yeah, as I said, unfortunately, because we can only run memcache. Uh, the small solution didn't run so very well. 
So, I didn't know that memcached maximum value size is one megabyte, and the list of my transients quickly got to four megabytes with just a few thousand transients in it. So I tried storing it in WP options inside the WordPress database, but yeah. MySQL didn't like it. I don't know why, not even today, but PHP could handle the value just fine. But production crashed a few times as a result of my smart code. So we simplified it a bit, left out the list, refetch, and inception mode. But a system like this could work just wonderfully with readers or any least recently used cache without sensible value limits. And my remote just broke. Nice. Hello. Can I press this? This is my demo effect today. Do you want to switch to right click? It works. So. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. So I don't see my own presentation anymore, but I don't need the notes. It's just that I'm switching context like statement in time, so I really need the notes, but who cares? So we run it over the weekend. It didn't go over the four megabytes, and we pretty much populated all the transients that we ever would. But yeah, MySQL chokes on the transient list, so we didn't have the possibility to use it. But if you use Redis, Redis, how do you pronounce it? I don't care. But yeah, you could use this. So I'm going to show you some code. This is the disclaimer. I hacked it together from the parts of code that I wrote and the parts of the code that are now in production, so no guarantees whatsoever. So look into it, and I will publish a toolkit plugin containing similar features than these, uh, but I have to have time first. <laughs> maybe it's done next week, maybe it isn't. But yeah, just to show you how these aren't really complicated things, it's just it's different. So here's the transidentify class constructor. It's, um, I'm not going to go into detail, but basically it sets a key that's uh, the base of all transient keys. So we use, we have a custom access level system, so we embed data from that to the key, so we can have uh, different transients for different access levels. Um, these are just functions that really shouldn't get anything from WP options, but they do. And here's the partial options of the class. So basically, you can set uh, different expiry or different permissions for bypassing transients. So basically, every editor that we have has to ha get the latest content instead of the cached content. I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, prefetching is also pretty easy. You just maintain the list and then you call it in with a cron job and you loop the list. So uh, the interesting part of this is this get function. So basically the get function doesn't do anything with get data callable here uh, unless the transient is actually missing or invalid. So if there's no transient it will call get data and it's up to get data to set the transient with the set function. As you see, it's past this, so it has access to the same transientify instance. And this is just the magic behind it. It's rather simple code, but don't do this. And yeah, it's just a cron job that triggers the prefetching. <laughs> so to show you the category endpoint, uh, custom endpoints that we have, this is our category endpoint that I built. So, yeah, you just define the endpoint in the constructor and you define an expiry for it. This is the transient length and this is the actual API endpoint. It's pretty simple, but under these is like 2,000 lines of code, so. 
transients are really required in this case. To show you the basic class under the custom REST route that we have, uh, it's rather simple. It just extends WP REST controller. Uh, yeah, you s give it a namespace and a route, and that's it. Then you use create endpoint in the child class to create your endpoints. And yeah, this is just so complex that I don't have the time to explain it, so actually 10, <laughs> 35. Yeah, so I'm not going to explain it. It's there. Take a picture if you want. I'm going to put my slides online today. It's there. I'm in a bit of a hurry here. <laughs> so uh, transient cleaner, it's just basically hooks on the filters or actions. And if uh, it loops things, if it matches transient, it will clear it. This is really just an ug ugly class that does nothing nice. Don't think of me as a good coder, especially Yako. <laughs> so, uh, I don't think I have time for this, but basically every request that we make from the client side to WordPress is cached to local Forex, which uses indexed database behind it. This makes our application faster over time and allows for offline use. We actually shipped the offline feature yesterday, but we had to roll back it for other, other unrelated issues. But, yeah. So if we were to make changes to the data that we have stored on the user's device and we change the components, uh, everything will break. So we have to do something to make the local database clearable. So we used versions. Basically, these are just objects that contain some properties like the version and these are compared with uh, you, yeah. These are compared with um, future classes that I'm going to show. You. But yeah, you can use a version to clear all data from a user's device. So we simply create create local for each source, add a wrapper class around it to add some functionality. So. We used hashes for the keys to store to save a bit on user disk space. We compare the version of the cache item with the application version, and if it's too late, like or it has been, it's said that it should clear. We will nuke the cache, and that's it. And yeah, it's a rather simple code too. So we can hook this up to the data retrieval functions that we have. We have a WP client JavaScript class as well. I'm not going to show that, but we have that. So we have hooked into the get method of it. So all of it, if data is going to be cached automatically. But it has a problem, like it's going to keep going forever. So let's build a least recently used cache for the front end based on the this storage class. So uh, we have a list of um, all the items in the cache. It can contain a thousand items, and if it goes over that, it will clean 10% out automatically. No. Uh, then that's just basic. So we override the get method inside this storage to set the order every time a request is made or and accessed from the cache, it moves upwards in the list so it doesn't get removed. And it just uses the this storage get on behind of it. And this is just the cleaning method. It's not the manual, but this works. So uh, on top of that, I'm going to have to wrap up update this one, I think. Yeah, so dealing with fragmented data, 
which made me regret not using TypeScript. But basically, there's many different formats, or at least two in this case, for simulating the same data. Like this is a response from a WordPress native endpoint of an image, featured image to be stacked. And this is an ACF field image inside a REST API response. So as you can see, they're a bit different, contain the same data, usually. So this is the case for everything inside the ACF fields that we have from this plugin and other things as well, but for the sake of simplicity. So we want to use the same components regardless of if it's an ACF image or featured image. So we used models. This is basically just a JavaScript object that contains these properties at all times and the components can rely on them so they don't have so they don't have to do this kind of ugly thing inside the component and don't ask why ACF image is always an image dot kuva. That's just a five year old thing that we couldn't change. So, uh, okay, I have time for this then. So, authentication uses will with WordPress, the obvious uh, thing to use was cookies, like that was the easiest one. Anyone that's made a REST API request from the WP admin has wondered why it's so easy, probably I did. But with cookies, you have to use nonces with uh, important requests, and you can't do that, or you can, I did, and when I run into trouble, I want to ask for help. And this is what Ryan McHugh told me. So basically he said, fundamentally, QQ authentication is only meant to be used inside plugins or themes, and if you're not using them, you shouldn't do it. Just ignore the rest of what he said. I don't like the idea of creating a single page application that's bootstrapped by WordPress. So moving on to other options, JSON web tokens we used briefly, uh, but they're meant for server-to-server -server applications and not really client-side applications. So OAuth it was, we used this commercial plugin called WP OAuth Server, which is in this address. I don't re really recommend it, it was horrid, but it did the job. <laughs> so uh, this is how you set it up. Um, yeah, so the doc suggests that you do this, even though this is from the user credentials grant type documentation. You might see something wrong with this. So base64 isn't an encryption, it's just an encoding. So if you were to embed this to client side, we would have some troubles later on. So what could possibly go wrong with this one? <laughs> Everything. So let's do something else. So instead of finding the uh, documentation blindly, we did that, but with a REST API endpoint. So we just post the username and password at the header and forward the request to the OAuth server and return it to the client normally. So I'm gonna have to wrap up now, but this is how we did the authentication. I spent like two months getting it done. So I don't really recommend that plugin, but I don't know what your options are. So I'm gonna have to skip this. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, but too much content, I know. So, to send you down some rabbit holes, here's the reasoning behind the nonces from REST API. Take a picture if you want. And here's the Puppeteer start article. We just did this one and added some boilerplate and put it to production. It has worked tremendously well. No more, I can just recommend it, just do it. And this was the Google Tag Manager answer. And um, yeah. yeah, I've been Kisoli, thank you. Thank you. So we have about five minutes for questions. So if we have some audience questions, please raise your hands and then there will be a mic given to you. So there's one in the back corner.
Hey. Hi. This was a fully React front-end, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, is there any reason why you chose Puppeteer over, for example, Next.js or something like that, which actually provides uh, all of yeah, the server Yeah, basically. Rendering? Did your question continue or did I interrupt you? Oh, um. uh, so we didn't want to use Next.js because uh, it's React, but it's different. You can't use same kind of things. Like you can't use React Router with Next.js. And we wanted to use React Router. Mm, you just wanted to use it. And we wanted to try Puppeteer, so... <laughs> I see, because you have in, uh, in Next, you have the possibility to do server-side rendering, and every concurrent request after the initial request is done in the client, right? I'm not sure if I heard that. In Next, you can actually do both things. You can do server-side rendering. Yeah. On the initial page Yeah, page I've load. used Next.js uh, briefly. <laughs> I liked it a bit, but we just didn't go with it. No other reason that. Any other? Thank you. Yeah, other questions? There's one over there. Um, when building this, did you look at GraphQL over using a REST API? Uh, I wish I used GraphQL, <laughs> but we didn't have the expertise. No one knew how to use it, but everyone wanted to use it, but we didn't know how to set it up. I've heard uh, Morgan, I think, has set it up. I'm not sure. Maybe. I heard that. But maybe someone from them is going to talk about it sometime. I am Christopher. Uh, did you notice... Uh, change in SEO performance before and after the, the, the site? Uh, yes, it went down. <laughs> 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 yeah, but uh, it's been temporary. We had some problems with the property, obviously. But yeah, uh, it's going back. Uh, the, I don't know actually why it's going down, but maybe it's because it wasn't able to find sitemaps in the beginning, and that caused us a bit of trouble. But every new article that we publish is there for within like 15 minutes from publishing. If you find with the title, put it to Google, it's there. So it should be okay. But definitely metrics are down. Yep. More questions? There was one on the way. Someone already mentioned uh, Next.js. Uh, did you ever consider Gatsby? Uh, isn't that uh, more like, I don't know what to call it. It's a basic. So, it's yeah, so it's like uh, more like a uh, generator. generator. Yes, but it's basically a framework, a little bit like Next.js. Like yeah, well, yeah, so and I hadn't heard of Gatsby before, before we started this. Yeah, so because it, it would no. have, uh, have a, like a built-in direct like WordPress support and oh, with the GraphQL. So yeah, so if sounds nice. Kind of, so kind of maybe I'll consider that in the future. Yeah, most of this stuff would have been solved just by. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thanks for telling me that now and not a year ago. <laughs> I said that I was going to build this, so why didn't no one tell me what to do? Like I had no idea what to do, but we did it. Yeah, we have one more question on the back there. Uh, was there a reason why you wanted to use the build-in WordPress REST API endpoints? Because I have found it easier to use a transform function to put the data in the format I want to use instead of just using whatever Word, WordPress spits out. Uh, yeah, mainly it was an MVP. That was the reason and we kind of had to stick with it. It's going to improve in the future, I'm sure of that, but uh, as a minor announcement, this is my last day at Vincent, so I don't know how it's going to evolve at this point. <laughs> okay, I think we're out of time for questions, so yeah, once more, let's give a hand to Christian. <laughs>